looking at best ball adp and looking at the key areas where to make those decisions make those pivot points for the optimum draft as you move through it we have been getting a lot of questions in around the certain rounds where it's a little bit flat a little bit tricky and what to do in those situations that's what we're going to talk about today as we recap our recent draft myself and sean did over at underdog fantasy we drafted from the 107 started off with austin eckler but sean it was a fun draft good to get back into the swing of things to kind of navigate that adp to start to see some of those pivot points that i mentioned fun draft looking forward to doing more of these as we go through the off season starting earlier and earlier every single season and that is what brings a lot of the fun to it if you are playing over at underdog fantasy just a reminder you can use code rotoviz get yourself a 100 percent sign up bonus up to 100 dollars. once again that code is rotoviz sean we have the first draft of the ot season over at underdog fantasy in the books what are your thoughts on how the draft progressed how the team ended up Maybe start off, we'll have a, a little recap of, of how things went. So we get Austin Eckler, Jalen Waddle, Mark Andrews, Christian Watson, Drake London. Then we go with Marquise Brown, Traylon Burks, Tua, AJ Dillon, David Montgomery, Wendell Robinson, Jordan Love, Damian Harris, Mike Gesicki. Then we pair up Taekwon Thornton. And there we get Kendry Miller, Chuba Hubbard, who Sean with some very bold predictions for on that show. And then we get Desmond Ritter, Marvin Mims, and Kate Otten to round things out so it is a three quarterback three tight end build and i'm pretty happy with uh, i think we have to call this team sean the second year tight end team because we love those rookies we love those second year guys but we're really putting a bet on these second year players to deliver us to i guess first place in this in this contest which has a pretty tasty uh prize up top of two hundred thousand dollars so how are you feeling after that draft in the 107 Good, good. I think ideally we would be either at the back end of the draft or in the top six. But having a middle pick, even if you end up with a little bit of a compromise selection here with Austin Eckler, there's a lot that you can do with that in terms of not being blindsided by runs. You're able to build the structure the way you want. You can grab some values when they drop. We had a couple players who almost fell to us who would have been way, way, way below ADP in that part is always interesting when you start off with the guy who won the two million dollars last year in austin eckler and perhaps the best running back in the nfl someone in austin eckler who probably isn't the best pure rusher and struggled as a runner at times this season one of the things that los angeles chargers are emphasizing it appears as they build out their offensive staff and look to the 2023 season is the ability to run the ball more effectively it's kind of crazy to think that that is the Chargers need when Austin Eckler has been such a machine scoring touchdowns the last two years. So with his age and with some of the things that they want to do on offense, you know that there are some risks. And yet, I mean, this is Austin Eckler. If you're going to pass on Austin Eckler with the seventh pick, you know, be a little bit like passing on Christian McCaffrey, passing on some of these other legends. At some point, Eckler is going to go the route of Dalvin Cook, Alvin Kamara, Ezekiel Elliott. Guys who, in various ways, looked to pretty definitively be running on fumes in the 2022 season. There is that risk with Eckler, and yet the upside is you win the whole thing. So we like that, and it creates this foundation running back to where then we can go with five wide receivers in the next six picks. You're able to get that elite tight end. You can put the three QBs together with this group where you have Tua, who completely healthy, is going to be a guy like a Joe Burrow who is competitive with the dual threat quarterbacks. Joe Burrow goes at the 302. The contrast between that and Tua in the eighth round, very, very significant. You also have Love and Ritter, two very contingency-based types of selections where if they hit, they're likely to hit big. And in both of those cases as well, we have a wide receiver with them, I love the structure that we have here, Colin. I love a lot of the players. You mentioned the second year jump that we could get from a handful of these guys. I think also value picks at a number of places. I like the running backs that we have. I don't think that you should be able to get these profiles this inexpensively. I'm interested to see where ADP goes over the next couple of months. 
yeah, it's going to be very interesting. And Sean, with our team kind of as the, the template, or this draft is the template, we're going to answer a question that came in from Kevin. But we did have a number of questions very, very similar over the last couple of weeks. And um, we're going to go with Kevin's one to, to work through here. So he mentioned that he's started participating in big board tournaments on underdog. And when he gets to rounds three to five, he doesn't really like the available options and finds himself diversifying among the same eight or so players that he likes most in that ADP range and getting more exposure to them than he may feel comfortable with so i'm getting a lot of really good value in the rounds but after that i don't want to reach some players carrying adps in the six through eight round range i feel like it's a bit of a weird year for adp so far and wanted to put some get some input from you guys concerning if you feel the same way and generally what your strategy has been for using the underdog roster and scoring settings so far so sean there's a couple of kind of questions there i think we can look into is one of the things is getting more exposure than somebody may feel comfortable with based on drafting players and that range the other one is you know not wanting to reach we did touch on this in the draft but not wanting to reach a round or two and i think reaching a round or two earlier in the draft can be diff- more difficult than if it's in you know round 12 versus round 14 if it's round six versus round eight may be a little bit more of a challenge for some people to do so the first one is you know diversifying exposure is that something that we should be overly concerned about at this point as ADP continues to evolve true. And then the second part is the reaching at ADP question. I think ADP is very much in flux at this point. It is pretty much set, but we are going to see movers. So the part about the weird year for ADP so far, I think a lot of that is we touched on like the quarterback part of it. There's a lot of players maybe drafting where they know the player is kind of set in a safe enough position rather than taking risks on players like you mentioned, Keenan Allen, Sean, who drafted Mike Kosicki, for example, where their landing spot, while it is a risk, can also provide a huge amount of additional value to the range where they are getting selected at at the moment. So we'll, we'll jump into those two questions, Sean, first, and then we'll look at maybe the players going in those specific ranges. What are your thoughts on, on Kevin's question here? The first part of it, about getting too much exposure is going to depend a lot on how many drafts you plan to do and how you plan to spread them throughout the course of the year. Michael Dumers had done a lot of great research on the best times to draft and it tends to be very early and then very late. So early when you can benefit from all of the ADPs that are exploitable. And right now, at least to our eyes, there are a ton of ADPs like that. If you're confident in your ability to both select the best players and then also anticipate how ADP is going to move, because that's one of the things that I think is fairly straightforward here is you can look at the players and if you were to pick out the 20 players most likely to fall and the 20 players most likely to rise, I think that you're probably going to get 17 to 18 correct in both groups And you want to use that information as you're drafting that is relevant to you. And then again, drafting at the very end, when you have a ton of information, when the teams are set, when the depth charts are set, when the injury information about who's just going to be available in the first three, four, five, six weeks is there. Adept drafters who have that info tend to do very well in their final draft. So that's something to keep in mind. If you're going to do a couple hundred drafts, I don't think being overweight on certain players early makes that much difference because you don't know if you'll be able to get them later. One of the reasons that you're drafting these guys now is that the prices on them are good. They're the best picks. They might not always be. One of the things that we did last season was to draft a lot of Brees Hall because we expected that he was going to get more expensive. Some of the other guys... That we did that with like a Travis ETN did get a lot more expensive. Brees Hall didn't necessarily. I mean, there were some times when his price spiked a little bit. And then as you go through and you find, well, I mean, his price is never going to where it should be. Then I think you're okay being overweight. The problem is that players do get hurt. And so it depends a little bit on how you want to play these leagues and where you want the risk to be. There are a lot of drafters who diversify themselves out of ever having a good year and are kind of hoping to hit on a big win where their team was just lucky. 
I mean, if you're completely diversified, you're basically just betting on luck. You're not bringing anything to the table yourself that would give you an advantage. When you are a little bit overweight in the best players, like a Brees Hall, then the risk is that that guy gets hurt. So to be heavy on Brees Hall really at all points last season and then to see him go out and be basically the best pick in fantasy football, I think that you have to do that and you have to be willing to take the blow that occurs when the player gets hurt. Now, again, not everybody is going to want to do it the exact same way. There were some other good selections last year. Obviously, I mean, Josh Jacobs managers are going to say, I mean, <laughs> what do you mean about Brees Hall? But Josh Jacobs was less expensive and he was the fantasy MVP. I don't dispute that. Josh Jacobs ended up being a very good pick. We made some picks in this draft column that I think are pretty similar to that. And we selected AJ Dillon, David Montgomery in rounds nine and 10 if you told me that one of those guys was this year's Josh Jacobs, I wouldn't be surprised at all. And that's not to say that we're going to get a Josh Jacobs every year. One of the reasons that Josh Jacobs was so inexpensive for what he went on to do is that his profile usually busts. And so you want to keep that in mind also. But so you, you think about these rounds here and you think about what you're getting, especially if the players are seven or eight. As Kevin mentions, I, I guess I don't think that that's a problem. When you start to take everybody again, I mean, you're going to maybe have some structural advantages and you still are going to be at least slightly overweight on some guys and underweight on some others. But I mean, basically what you're doing, if you're heavily diversified, is just feeding in to the system and giving your money away. And, and again, hoping to get lucky, which that's not to say that luck isn't important. Any of us who win these big tournaments, you did get lucky, but I strongly believe that you position yourself to take advantage of the luck in a way that most drafters are actually not doing. Yeah, and I think all you mentioned they're diversifying. There's the diversification off the roster based on taking some of those players early, but I do think it's very important. You mentioned your example, which hurt at the end of the season, the Brees Hall one, but if Brees Hall doesn't get hurt and it leads to you know one of the best rookie running back seasons of all time, then you're into a situation where you have a lot more chances to go and win in that prize money but he also mentioned sean rounds three to five mentioning like eight players I, I don't think that that's all that little of an amount of players to be wanting to draft in those rounds like when i look through rounds three through five in our draft there's a lot of players on there that i will have very little interest in drafting this year it's more than eight i will hold my hands up and say that but there is about i would say half the players in those rounds so there's 36 players drafted there there's 18 of them that I probably and this is just quick math that I probably have legitimate interest in having on my roster there's going to be players then that I'm happy to, to skip over on all occasions moving forward so eight is quite low but I, I don't think that it's that unusual to have you know a certain amount of players that you're only particularly interested in the draft and particularly at the, this stage of the season I also mentioned though Sean that the players that he is liking is in the six through eight range so Let's have a look at the, the players, though, in that three through five range first. And maybe we'll give our opinions on, on some of the players that, you know, or how many of them you feel you would want to draft. The 301 is Josh Jacobs. Then we get Joe Burrow, Garrett Wilson, Chris Olave, Devontae Smith, DK Metcalf, Mark Andrews, then it's DeAndre Hopkins, Nick Chubb, Debo Samuel, Lamar Jackson, Ramondre Stevenson. Comes back with Justin Fields, TJ Hawkinson, Najee Harris, Amari Cooper, Calvin Ridley, who I think is getting going to be very, very interesting to see. That's the the mid fourth for Ridley, who obviously missed last season. I think he's going to be. You know, Jacksonville could be a lot. A, there were a lot of fun last year. It could be a lot, a lot of fun this year. Christian Watson, Mike Williams, Justin Herbert, Michael Pittman, Christian Kirk, DJ Moore, Dallas Goddard, and then we get Dalvin Cook, Chris Godwin, Trevor Lawrence, Tony Pollard, George Kittle, Jerry Judy, Drake London, Terry McLaurin, Jackson Smith, and Jigba. Then we get. Damian Pierce, Keenan Allen, and Jamison Williams to round it out. I may have been harsh on half of those players that I, I don't want, but I do think part of the perception around drafting those players at this point, I'm not saying this is the case for Kevin, but a lot of these players were going in much, much later ranges last year. And obviously they had good seasons. And I think sometimes people are afraid to draft players this year in the you know fourth round that they drafted last year in the you know 14th round. Um What's your thoughts, Sean, looking at that? I mentioned half of the players. I was doing that without counting them up. But how do you feel? Is there, There's probably quite a few in there that will not be on our draft boards here for 2023. Yeah, I've got 19 guys out of the 36 
that I my feel, match was almost perfect. Almost yeah, perfect. That I, feel pretty comfortable with and so that does give you a decent amount of flexibility i think i understand what he's saying and that the prices uh, in rounds two through four especially now as compared to three or four years ago you do see some differences the drafts are tighter the players that you want to take that secondary leap are more expensive i mean garrett wilson and chris olave at the 303 and 304 are very good picks and yet a lot of what they're going to do is priced in yeah, and yeah. so that part of it is frustrating. You have Devontae Smith here in this particular draft at the 305. He's going to have a ton of big games next season. But when you think about where you could get him last year, but then also what he has to do to justify that, it's just so tricky with both A.J. Brown, who goes at the 110, and Smith at the 305, because in any given game, their team doesn't need them to score in order to put up a lot of points and wins. So you're going to get some duds in there. That's a little bit more effective in best ball than it is in redraft. Even in redraft, though, I mean, you're really looking at the total points at the end. Everybody's going to have some duds, but that sort of mix of players and talent within the context of an offense that could be run heavy at times, it illustrates that even the really exciting players you're having to pay at levels that are uncomfortable. Then you go through this long stretch of picks. I mean, DK Metcalf will be one of the players I feel comfortable with, but not necessarily excited for in the middle of the third. We selected Mark Andrews. I think Ramondre Stevenson of the 312 is a really interesting pick. And yet, I mean, is that more or less chasing last year's points and chasing points from backs who were in better situations? So uh, the lack of comfort there, I don't think is incorrect in any way, shape, or form. You get to the the 401, Justin Fields, a really interesting pick, even though we would probably prefer to get into round six, seven, eight before we look at, at QBs. TJ Hawkinson in there. It's interesting to see his jump after you know our selections of him last season were generally panned, and he was much less expensive at that point. You and I take Christian Watson. He's obviously a player that we're comfortable with. I think he's in a range there where the other guys are kind of gross, right? This is an Amari Cooper, Calvin Ridley. We take Watson, then Mike Williams, Michael Pittman, Christian Kirk. I was arguing a little bit for Pittman on the show, but generally speaking, Watson is the guy who jumps out there as at least being exciting, not that the other players aren't going to score points. If I'm doing the draft by myself, I probably pick Pittman or DJ Moore, obviously doing the draft with you and a Green Bay Packers super fan. I was excited to get my Watson Explosion and there. you also, uh, tie, you know, over in Mark Andrews. So I think that was a balancing out of the you know, process. That's right. Column wanted Debo Samuel instead of Mark Andrews in round three. Debo Samuel, maybe the third best wide receiver in football after Justin Jefferson and Jamar Chase. I thought but... you were going to say the third best wide receiver on his team. I, I was wondering where that was going. <laughs> <laughs> but again, Debo's fall here illustrates again the risk that we have with aj brown and Devonte smith in 2023 a lot of similarities between the 49ers and the eagles you start to get into round five and it gets really interesting and again i think this is something that kevin's alluding to in his question where he mentions rounds six through eight the pick i really wanted to make and the player who i think really is more of a third round value is jerry judy jerry judy getting within one pick of our selection at the 507, I mean, you want to have that every single draft. You're going to resist a little bit taking him way early because you don't want to end up with 100% exposure. But to look at these possible selections and then to wrap that back into Kevin's question, I do think that there is some reason to consider taking guys in rounds six through eight. And if you need that to diversify, especially because if you have the guys in round six through eight and you've got them labeled as number one targets and then number two, you expect their ADPs to rise, just drafting them early here and getting a good mix and a heavy concentration, that's not necessarily a problem. When you're drafting against people in this particular contest – before the ADP's job, because we do sort of expect this to fill early enough that not all of the ADP's are going to correct, and people who are drafting later on in it will get different values. If you are consistently reaching, and, and this tournament is big enough, and there are enough very sophisticated managers that mostly these picks are going 
by ADP with some small variation where people are looking at their structure. They're looking to try and get some values. They are looking to build some slightly unique teams. But if you go in and you draft players in round six through eight who, I mean, you just have as much higher values, you're going to have a different mix of players than most other drafters. That's a huge value to you if those guys hit. In the end, the price is more or less irrelevant. It's the scoring level that the player brings to the table. And if your roster then is different because you reached on these guys and they hit, you're in a fantastic position. So as opposed to going through and getting yourself locked into guys you don't want in rounds three through five or feeling uncomfortable because you're starting to get just way too much DJ Moore or way too much Jerry Judy, way too much JSN, whoever the guy happens to be, go ahead and draft players who should be going much earlier from six through eight and give yourself those unique teams. It doesn't mean that's necessarily going to work, but for the same reason, the players who are just going out there and more or less diversifying and taking these very tiny ADP wins are more or less just focusing on luck. If you go ahead and reach on players in round six through eight, you're giving yourself an actual advantage in that you're building a unique team. You're planting your flag on these players. You're getting players that you want. Those could be the tournament winning teams. If you do it a handful of times and you hit, I mean, you could have multiple teams that move on deep into this tournament, doing things a little bit differently than the crowd. As long as those moves are intentional and those moves are smart and you put thought into the players and you have a very strong thesis for why they're undervalued, you're not going to just do it randomly to be different. But if you have a strong thesis for why those selections make sense, I think you've got to trust yourself. You've got to do that. Otherwise, I I don't think there's that much point to playing if you're not willing to actually stand behind your ideas and to make some cool picks. So I would encourage that. Again, you know, you, you don't necessarily need to be crazy with it because feathering in a few of those selections is going to get you to where you need. You don't necessarily want to be the person who is drafting all of these crazy picks and people are saying, well, I mean, this person doesn't have any idea of of where the guys are going you can do both things you can be both patient and aggressive you can be humble and aggressive you can be conservative and come through with teams that are unique and creative colin we'll continue to talk about some specific players in this section and some specific methods for doing it as we go through the next couple of months yeah definitely we will and something you mentioned there is like it's not a case of like you have to go two rounds over adp on every single selection it is a case of like most rounds you're going to find the player you like but in those spots that we don't we did it a couple of times in this draft where we took a player ahead off adp by you know more than 24 picks on a, a couple of occasions to get that kind of into the roster just to run through for people listening and wondering what round six through eight kind of looks like there is a lot of players in here that I feel like we like Sean, we talk about a lot. And I sometimes wonder when we're talking about them, is that making people feel better about drafting them? But Tyler Lockett starts off around, but DeAndre Swift, who I was hoping that we may get, who did slip by ADP in this draft, but you get George Pickens, who we talked quite a bit about a couple of weeks back, Aaron Jones is there, Mike Evans. But we took Marquise Brown. You talked about why you like him so much entering this season. Kyle Pitts, who was one of our favorite players entering last year, but obviously didn't work out. But he's now going in the mid-sixth round, so still a very positive option at the 6.07 to try and have him in there. We have Joe Mixon, Brandon Ayuk, Jamar Gibbs, Isaiah Pacheco, Javante Williams, who's obviously coming back from injury, but this, the last pick of the sixth round makes him very, very interesting. Dak Prescott, Cam Akers, Deontay Johnson. I did touch on this in the draft, and we touched on George Pickens, as I mentioned in a couple of shows. Sean likes those Pittsburgh wide receivers moving into the season and I think the other part of that that we didn't talk about on the show because he didn't last to a point where we were making a quarterback pick was Kenny Pickett I think he's quite interesting as well we get Tyler Algier we get Alvin Kamara Jordan Addison Traylon Burks who we took then we get Cortland Sutton and I don't think it's going to be identical but there's parts of me wondering <laughs> if how bad Denver was last year we could see something similar to the and I, I don't think it's going to happen to the same extent, but the, the recovery that we've seen from the Jaguars last year, and we could see a lot of revitalized fantasy value in Judy and Sutton moving forward. J.K. Dobbins working back from that injury. Jahan Dodson. I'm excited about Dodson this year. 
we got Davis, who disappointed what we thought last year, but again, 7 11 in this draft. We got Bateman, we got Kadarius Tony, Miles Sanders, James Cook, Quentin Johnson. Then we're into a quarterback kind of range. We got Kirk Cousins, we took Tua, Deshaun Watson, James Conner, David Njoku, Jacoby Myers, Evan Ingram, who had the best season of his career, and then Darren Waller as well. So there's a lot of names in there. I'm sure that people, when they're listening and are kind of nodding their head, and they can understand where kevin's question about the excitement there is a lot of players in there that are quite interesting that part of it i do think is you feel like you're potentially getting a discount on where they were going last year as well i i I wonder if that perception is is coming in there but i do like a lot of players in there and what i found sean in our draft is true rounds 10 there's a lot of interesting options and we had this last year but starts to flatten out quite a bit then but i did feel in those final five six rounds there was a lot of options that, of players that that we liked that were still available where you had to make a decision one versus the other rather than there was a period of time kind of maybe between rounds 11 and 13 or 14 where i was like do we have to make a pick here <laughs> can we trade back and that wasn't an option but yeah really enjoyed doing the draft liked uh, going through the question that kevin sent in thanks again for sending that and lots of interesting questions shared over the last couple of weeks and we do try and fit them in where it is possible this is a good time of year to work through some of the questions that you may have so if you do have ones send them my way on twitter at overtime ireland or email them over at overtime ireland at gmail.com we'll try and fit some of them in in the upcoming weeks we are going to have our listeners draft this week over at the ffpc myself and sean drafting against 11 other listeners looking forward to that those shows will come out over the course of the next week or so i will be on vacation i'm heading over to lanzarote which i'm quite excited to do to spend some time over there but we will have shows coming your way over the course of that time so check out the road of his overtime podcast feed make sure you're subscribed to get those shows once they are available sean as we get ready to wrap up any final thoughts on the the draft here and and how things shook out oh and it was a lot of fun i really enjoyed selecting Marvin Mims in round 19. Keep an eye on the road of his rookie guide for some more information on him as we go through the next two additions. He's someone I wrote an article on for the site recently. I think he's flying under the radar there. Colin, drafting in mid-February is an absolute blast. We're looking forward to doing the exercise with all of the listeners this weekend. We'll have a lot more content to go with that draft. We expect the listeners to come out and really take it to us. So can't wait. They usually do. (laughs) Yeah, they they really do take it to us. And we're talking about ADPs here. Let's see how things play out in that draft. I think we'll we'll, uh, see some interesting running backs maybe falling. Sean, the listeners have forced us i think is the word i'll use to draft running backs more than we would like on certain occasions and we'll see how it plays out this weekend looking forward to it but that is to come next week but until we are back with another show my name is colin kelly you can follow me on twitter at over to you can check out all of sean's work up at rotaviz.com until then have a good one